Thanks, folks. Well, um, as many people have mentioned so far, this is a, a long-term kind of data set. There are multiple data sets that we're talking about today. And I'll be talking about 25 years of phenology monitoring um, between FPR, Vermont Forest Parks and Rec, and VMC, with the slight caveat that I'm just under a year in my position. So when I'm using the word we or something like that, that's largely the work of other folks like Sandy Wilmot and Tom Simmons and others in the department. Um, but it's a pretty interesting story with what they've done with phenology data and monitoring over the years. So what I'll do is I'll give you kind of a brief overview of the history of the program, some of the major findings that we, they found, and as well, some of the next steps for phenology monitoring in the state. So back in 1991 is when this really all started, and it came out of the idea that sugar maple foliage was being damaged in a variety of locations by an insect known as pear thrips. And um, what's kind of interesting about pear thrips, it emerges from the soil early in the spring, um, at the same time that buds are developing within sugar maple and then going to leaf out and that sort of thing. So the interest of the organization was to look at the timing of that emergence of the insect with the development of the bud and see if there was anything that lined up routinely that you could say, with this many growing degree days, buds will be this full and the insects will be most plentiful. Um, and so they established plots at Proctor Maple Research Center uh, to track these various stages of development in both leaves, buds, and um, the insect. And the way that these were monitored was actually the same way that we're collecting this data today. Um, and that's by putting these sticky traps out in the spring and weekly going there and quantifying the number of pear thrips that emerge onto the trap um, and documenting that on a week by week basis. At the same time, we're going out there with a spotting scope to look at the same sugar maple trees year after year uh, and looking at the actual bud development, which can be kind of a challenge without a spotting scope, if you can imagine, to look at these small um, little changes within each individual bud. And what we try and do is evaluate the portion of the crown that is in each stage of development, everything from dormancy to elongation, bud break, leaf expansion, and full leaf out. Um, and what was found from this initial work was that there was a, quite a bit of variability in the timing of when the insects would emerge, as well as the timing of, of bud development. It, it varied from year to year, nothing completely lined up. But what was found was that this small amount of, let's see if I can nail it, there we go. Um, this small amount of bud break, where just a little bit of green was exposed in the buds, was enough for the pear thrips that were around to actually feed on those buds and damage the foliage. Um, so that was the initial idea behind monitoring these year after year trends of bud development and insect emergence. But it became pretty clear that monitoring this sort of thing year after year has a broader use than just looking at how it pairs with one insect. And so efforts expanded to include um, other hardwood species as well to look at bud development in them, American beech, yellow birch, red maple, and white ash. And the idea here was to look at how the timing of these different species and their bud development actually lined up, um, especially in the context of early season stressors, whether they be abiotic like spring frosts or other insect feeding as well. And what was found was that American beech and yellow birch were fairly synchronous with sugar maple, but that species like red maple and white ash did differ um, a little bit. But perhaps the most robust data set from this work is the sugar maple phenology data. And what we have here are graphs of sugar maple bud break over the years, as well as sugar maple leaf out, so full leaf expansion. Um, you have your year on the x-axis, day of the year, actually, on the y. And there's a couple things that you note here with these graphs. One is that there's quite a bit of variability in the actual data itself, and I'll get back to that in a little bit here. Um, but there is a slight suggestion that sugar maple bud break and leaf out are occurring at earlier dates. And so that obviously begs the question, how is climate playing into this? And that's something that was asked early on as well. Um, how this sort of data could be used to actually paint a picture of regional trends associated with a changing climate. And so obviously spring is a great place to start, but you need more data in order to, to actually paint a bigger picture. And so fall phenology measures were developed as well 
to track the same trees and identify what's going on um, over the whole season. So fall phenology was established at Proctor Maple Research Center as well. Um, and on those same sugar maple trees, leaf color and leaf drop were evaluated on a weekly basis in the fall through the full autumn season. This continued with other species as well, with white ash, yellow birch, and paper birch. And an additional elevation was actually added early on as well at 2,200 feet. Um, today we actually have a 2,600 feet, foot site as well. So we're able to look at changes amongst elevations and between species. Um, and obviously this allows us to track the progression of autumn and to track changes in the length of the growing season. So the methods we use for this are, uh, we don't necessarily need a spotting scope to go out there in the fall. You can see the color changing pretty easily. Um, but what we try and do is look at the, the full canopy of these trees and assess the portion of the crown that is undergoing fall color change or that isn't green. Um, quantify that and at the same time on the same dates weekly, we are looking at the portion of the crown that is actually dropped foliage, so the leaf drop there. And we take those two numbers and integrate them to give us kind of a peak color number. Um, at the same time, of course, by collecting that leaf drop data, we're also able to quantify when leaves have fallen off the tree. So these are data from Proctor Maple Research Center um, from the fall. Again, year on the x-axis, day of year on the y. Um, on the left is your peak color graph. On the right is leaf drop. Um, and this is at the two elevations, at 1,400 feet or 415 meters, and the 2,200 foot site with a dashed line. And what's been interesting over the years is that indeed is, has been sort of suggested uh, that it does look like peak color, especially in the lower elevation sites, uh, is occurring much later in the season. Um, and that the same holds true for leaf drop. We're not seeing quite the same relationship at upper elevations uh, with that response to climate, which is a little surprising, but, um, but it, there is the suggestion there as well. Now obviously, having spring and fall data allows us to actually paint a, a broader picture of how the growing season is changing uh, for these hardwood species in the state. And by looking at this over the long term, we see a somewhat loose relationship, but moderately significant in terms of how the growing season is actually lengthening with our potentially earlier springs and later falls. And um, what will be interesting as we go forward with this data, we'll continue to collect this and see if uh, some of that variability is reduced in by way of expanding this over time and seeing if this relationship tightens up at all over the length of the growing season. Um, but there are a couple other things that we're looking forward to, to doing with some of this data into the future. And that's not only to evaluate the same trees in both spring and fall to actually capture individual tree growing season lengths, but I think increasing the number of trees too is going to help us greatly reduce some of that variability that you see um, and paint a bigger picture of what's occurring in our forests. And finally, I mentioned I'd come back to this, this figure as well, that um, there is that tremendous amount of variability that you see here. And we're going to start looking at this data um, in a few different ways to see if we can assess that and see if it merits reevaluating and reassessing some of this data to, to reduce some of the variability that we see in here, if those lines might actually tighten up via different analyses. So we're looking forward to doing that in the future. And I'm going to keep it short and sweet. No questions, but there's my contact info, and thank you very much, folks.